Welcome to Crazy Nurse RN Hub, where learning becomes a tradition. Come, join me as we explore the multifaceted worlds of nursing. Now let's proceed to neurologic trauma. We have traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injury. First, let's discuss traumatic brain injury. Brain injury is an injury to the skull or brain that is severe enough to interfere with normal functioning. And it can be closed or blunt or open brain injury. For the closed or blunt brain injury, it occurs when the head accelerates and then rapidly decelerates or collides with another object and brain tissue is damaged. But there is no opening through the skull and dura. There is hyperextension of head and neck, a sudden backward acceleration of the skull creating extreme extension of cervical spine. Once the skull has stopped moving, the brain strikes the front of the skull. The head recoils forward and suddenly stops. Occipital brain impacts back of the skull. We also have your open brain injury. It occurs when an object penetrates the skull, enters the brain, and damages the soft brain tissue in its path. We call that penetrating injury, or when blunt trauma to the head is so severe that it opens the scalp, skull, and dura to expose the brain. For the assessment, we have altered level of consciousness, confusion, pupillary abnormalities, the patient would have altered or absent gag reflex, absent corneal reflex, sudden onset of neurologic deficits, changes in vital signs, also vision and hearing impairment, sensory dysfunction, headache, and seizure. For the possible nursing diagnosis, we have ineffective airway clearance and impaired gas exchange, risk for ineffective cerebral tissue perfusion, deficient fluid volume, imbalanced nutrition less than body requirements, also risk for injury. The patient is also risk for imbalanced body temperature and risk for impaired skin integrity, ineffective coping, disturbed sleep pattern, interrupted family processes, and deficient knowledge. Now let's have the planning and goals. So we have to maintain a patent airway. And also we have to maintain the fluid and electrolyte balance, adequate nutritional status, and prevention of secondary injury, and maintenance of body temperature within normal limits. Also we have to maintain our patient's skin integrity improvement of coping, prevention of sleep deprivation, effective family coping, increased knowledge about the rehabilitation process, and absence of complications. So these are the goals that we need to achieve in the management of our patient. For the nursing interventions, we have maintaining airway, monitoring fluid and electrolyte balance, promoting adequate nutrition, preventing injury, maintaining body temperature, maintaining skin integrity, improving coping, preventing sleep pattern disturbance, supporting family coping, monitoring and managing potential complications, and promoting home and community-based care. Now let's proceed to spinal cord injury. It occurs in the following situation such as falls, diving, and vehicular accident. 
and it results to the following effects below the level of lesion. We have paralysis, loss of reflexes, loss of sensory function, loss of motor function, and autonomic dysfunction. So we have here clinical manifestations depending on the location of the lesion or injury. First, we have your cervical spinal cord injury. And also, we have your thoracic spinal cord injury. For your cervical spinal cord injury, the injury at C2 and C3 is usually fatal. Cervical spinal cord injury can result to quadriplegia, which is a paralysis of all four extremities. And it could cause respiratory muscle paralysis. So we have here under your cervical, we have here your C1 to C3. This controls the neck muscle. We also have the C4 that controls your diaphragm, C5 deltoid or shoulder, C6 wrist, C7 we have the triceps, and C7 to C8 that controls your fingers. Next, we have your thoracic spinal cord injury. It can result to paraplegia. It is a paralysis in the lower extremities. And the patient would have a poor control of the upper trunk and there is a bowel or bladder retention. And it could lead to autonomic dysreflexia if the injury is above T6 and in cervical lesions. Autonomic dysreflexia results to uncontrolled hypertension. So in your thoracic, we have T1, which controls your hand. T2 to T12, we have your intercostals or trunk. T7 to L1, we have abdominals. And T11 to L2, this controls your ejaculation. Next, we have your lumbar spinal cord injury and your sacral spinal cord injury. For lumbar spinal cord injury, it can result to paraplegia, flaccid paralysis, and bowel and bladder retention. For L2, it controls your hips. For L3, it controls your quadriceps. L4 to L5, it controls hamstrings to knee. L4 to S1, it controls your foot. For your sacral spinal cord injury, the injury above S2 in males allows erection but no ejaculation. The injury between S2 to S4 prevents erection and ejaculation. And it could also result to paraplegia and also bowel and bladder incontinence. For your S2, it controls your penile erection. S2 to S3, it controls bowel and your bladder. So the higher the level of lesions, the greater is the probability to perform sexually. The lower the level of lesion, the lesser is the probability to perform sexually. The paraplegic male may experience impotence. The paraplegic female, on the other hand, is capable of pregnancy but unable to experience orgasm. Now let's proceed to the possible nursing diagnosis for spinal cord injury. Ineffective breathing patterns, ineffective airway clearance, impaired bed and physical mobility, risk for injury, we also have risk for impaired skin integrity, impaired urinary elimination, constipation, acute pain, and autonomic dysreflexia. For the planning and goals of treatment, we have improved breathing pattern and airway clearance, improved mobility, prevention of injury, and maintenance of skin integrity, relief of urinary retention, improved bubble function, decreasing pain, early recognition of autonomic dysreflexia, and absence of complications. 
So these are the goals that we need to achieve in our treatment or management of patients with spinal cord injury. For the nursing interventions, we have promoting adequate breathing and airway clearance, improve mobility, preventing injury due to sensory and perceptual alterations, maintaining skin integrity, and maintaining urinary elimination, improving bowel function, providing comfort measures, and recognizing autonomic dysreflexia. And also, promoting home and community-based care. Now let's proceed to infectious neurologic disorders. We have your meningitis and encephalitis. When we say meningitis, it is the inflammation of the brain and spinal cord meninges. There are two types of meningitis. We have your aseptic, that includes your viral meningitis and non-purulent. We also have your septic, or we have your viral, bacterial, fungal, which is much less common meningitis. So we have here a picture of the skull, the dura mater, the arachnoid, and the pia mater. So these are the coverings of your brain. Now let's discuss the clinical manifestations of meningitis. For the meningeal irritation, the patient will experience generalized strobing headache, photophobia, nuchal rigidity, Koenig sign, Brudzinski sign, opistotonus or the overarching of the back. For the neurologic signs, we have decrease in consciousness, cranial nerve palsies, focal neurologic deficits, seizures, projectile vomiting, papil edema, delirium, unconsciousness, and for the infectious sign, we have fever, chills, and malaise. So here is the signs and symptoms of patients who have meningitis. So they can experience severe headache, stiff neck, dislike of bright lights or photophobia, fever or vomiting, drowsy and less responsive, rash, it develops anywhere on the body. So we have here eliciting Koenig's sign. So to elicit Koenig's sign, place the patient in a supine position Flex her leg at the hip and knee, as shown in the picture. Then try to extend the leg while you keep the hip flexed. If the patient experiences pain and possibly spasm in the hamstring muscle and resists further extension, you can assume that the meningeal irritation has occurred. So that is a positive Koenig sign. We also have testing for Brudzinski sign. This is how you test for Brudzinski sign. With the patient in a supine position, place your hands behind her neck and lift her head towards her chest. If the patient has meningeal irritation, she will flex her hips and knees in response to the passive neck flexion. So that is positive Brudzinski sign. For the treatment, we have monitoring the vital signs, intake and output, cardiac rhythm, pulse oximetry, and laboratory values. We also administer ampicillin, rosifin, or clafuran. This is the drug of choice for meningitis because it crosses the blood-brain barrier. We also administer antipyretics for fever and infection and analgesics for pain. Also, we administer oxygen. We also replaced electrolytes through intravenous therapy. Bed rest in a darkened room since the patient is sensitive to light. Also, we administer anticonvulsants for 
seizure occurrence. Also, we isolate the patient. Meningococcal meningitis patients should be placed on droplet precautions such as private room, mask for all entering the room until they have completed 24 hours of appropriate antibiotic therapy. Lastly, seizure precaution. For the possible nursing diagnosis for patients with meningitis, we have ineffective cerebral tissue perfusion related to increased intracranial pressure, acute pain related to meningeal irritation, hyperthermia related to infection process, and risk for injury related to infection or seizure. For the nursing care, we have first is to assess for neurologic, cardiovascular, and respiratory status of the patient. Also, we have to implement isolation techniques as necessary. In this case, we practice droplet precaution. Medications are given as prescribed. Also, we administer oxygen as ordered. And seizure precaution at bedside for any possible seizure occurrences. Report meningococcal meningitis to local health authorities. Maintain quiet, dimly lit environment. This is to limit too much stimuli to the patient. Now let's proceed to encephalitis. Encephalitis is a severe inflammation of the brain caused by a mosquito-borne or a tick-borne virus. Virus transmitted by arthropods are arboviruses. Ingestion of infected goat's milk and accidental injection or inhalation of virus can be a cause of virus transmission. The eastern equine encephalitis can cause permanent neurologic damage and is commonly fatal. So we have here the different causes of encephalitis and how it is spread. First, we have your enterovirus and it can be spread through contact with body fluids. Also, we have your herpes simplex virus. It is person-to-person -person contact. We also have your HIV or human immunodeficiency virus when an infected person's blood or body fluids are introduced into the bloodstream of a healthy person. Also, we have your arboviruses, bites from mosquitoes that pick up the virus from the infected birds, chipmunks, squirrels, and other animals. And lastly, we have your animal-borne illnesses. Bites from infected animals such as cats, dogs, and bats. So we also have here a transmission route of West Nile virus, which also a cause of your encephalitis. So the birds are the reservoir of the West Nile virus. They harbor the virus but are unable to spread it. Mosquitoes serve as the vectors, spreading it from bird to bird and from birds to people. Humans are believed to be the dead-end host because the virus can live and cause illness in humans. But it is not believed that a feeding mosquito can acquire the virus from an infected person. For the signs and symptoms of your encephalitis, we have headache, sensitivity to light or photophobia. The patient will experience meningeal irritations such as neck stiffness and back, sleepiness or lethargy, increased irritability, skin rashes, neuronal damage as manifested by drowsiness, paralysis, seizures, ataxia, and organic psychosis vomiting, difficulty talking and speech changes, loss of appetite, and unsteady gait. In severe cases, an individual may experience the following. Loss of muscle power in the arms and legs, double vision, impairment of speech and or hearing, and coma. 
For the nursing care for encephalitis, we have specific supportive nursing measures which apply to the patient with meningitis should be followed, such as assess neurologic function, often focus on early changes in level of consciousness, monitor signs of herniation, such as abnormal posturing, Watch out for signs of cranial nerve involvement such as ptosis and diplopia. Provide emotional support and reassurance. Review prevention strategies such as adequate immunizations and protection against mosquito bites. And provide good mouth care and give medications as ordered. Now let's proceed to the autoimmune disorders. We have your multiple sclerosis, myasthenia gravis, Guillain-Barre syndrome, or your GBS. First, let's discuss multiple sclerosis, or MS. It is a chronic abnormal immune response. It is a progressive demyelination or the destruction of myelin sheet of motor and sensory neurons that has periods of remissions and exacerbations. So in multiple sclerosis, the myelin sheet of the neuron, which is a single cell whose membrane wraps around the axon, is destroyed with inflammation and scarring. So this causes problems in the nerve signals. So we have here a normal nerve, and we also have here nerve affected by multiple sclerosis. As you can see, the myelin sheet is damaged, exposing the nerve fibers. Thus, if this happens, there will be problems in the nerve transmissions. So here is a picture of multiple sclerosis with scoliosis. The multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disorder and it usually affects women, and it has a familial origin. The patient would experience tinnitus and decreased hearing, diplopia, nystagmus, blurred vision, dysarthria, dysphagia, and the onset is between 20 and 40 years old. The patient would experience urinary retention, spastic bladder, constipation, and the weakness may progress to paralysis. There is also muscle spasticity, ataxia, and vertigo. For the signs and symptoms, we have fatigue, which is one common problem. Generalized low energy feeling that related to depression and different from weakness. Patient would have mood swings, depression, and euphoria. In attentiveness, apathy, patient would experience forgetfulness, loss of memory, pain, paresthesia, and patient would have inability to gauge body position, intolerance to heat. For the possible nursing diagnosis, we have self-care deficit, fatigue, impaired physical mobility, ineffective breathing pattern, risk for injury, impaired elimination both in urinary or bowel, and ineffective individual coping. For the interdisciplinary care, our main goal here is optimal functioning. Also rehabilitation, treatments of exacerbations, and for the diagnosis, we base that on the manifestation of our patient and also, we perform MRI, which is the most definitive test to diagnose multiple sclerosis. We also have your CSF analysis. So we examine the cerebrospinal fluid with IgG, protein, and increased WBC. Also, we can perform CT scan of the brain, PET scan, and electrophysiologic evaluation. Also, the patient is positive for oligoclonal banding, and the EMG is abnormal. 
For the nursing care, first is promoting physical mobility. By way of frequent rest periods, preferably lying down to prevent extreme fatigue. Encourage walking exercises to improve gait. Apply warm packs to spastic muscles. And encourage daily exercises for muscle stretching to minimize joint contractures. Next is preventing injury. By way of teaching patients to walk with feet wide apart if motor dysfunction causes incoordination. Also, we have to teach patients to watch feet while walking if there is a loss of position sense. And assess for skin ulcers if the patient is confined to a wheelchair. Next is enhancing bladder or bowel control. Encourage patient to take prescribed medication for bladder spasticity. Teach intermittent catheterization if necessary. And provide adequate fluids, dietary fiber for constipation or fecal impaction. Now let's proceed to myasthenia gravis. It is a disorder of transmission at the neuromuscular junction that affects communication between the motor neuron and the innervated muscle cell. It is an autoimmune disease caused by an antibody-mediated destruction of acetylcholine receptors in the neuromuscular junction. So here we have your normal neuromuscular junction where there is an acetylcholine receptors. While in your myasthenia gravis, there is a blocking of ACH binding. So there is a production of anti-acetylcholine receptors, antibodies, thus inhibiting the acetylcholine to bind at the receptor site. So we have here a cholinergic neuron producing acetylcholine. However, there is a production of your anti-acetylcholine receptors. Thus, the acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter, could not bind to the receptor site, thus blocking the nerve signals. And this process could cause weakness to our patient. For the clinical manifestations of myasthenia gravis, we have ptosis and diplopia, skeletal weakness, dysarthria, dysphagia, vocal cords becomes impaired, difficulty in walking, and it could cause respiratory muscle paralysis and failure, and bowel and bladder weakness. We also have here Tensilon test. This is used to diagnose myasthenia gravis. It also differentiates between myasthenia crisis and cholinergic crisis. To diagnose crisis, endophonium or tensilon is administered to the client. Positive for myasthenia gravis is noted if the client shows improvement in muscle strength after the administration of tensilon. It is negative, however, if with no improvement in muscle strength and may even deteriorate after giving tensilon. Also, it is used to differentiate myasthenic crisis from cholinergic crisis. For myasthenic crisis, if strength improves after giving tensilon, the client needs more medication. So that is your myasthenic crisis. However, for your cholinergic crisis, if weakness is more severe after giving tensilon, the client is over-medicated. So we have to administer atropine sulfate, which is the antidote as prescribed. Now let's proceed to the nursing diagnosis. So ineffective airway clearance, impaired swallowing, risk for aspiration, and patient would experience fatigue. For the nursing care, so we have to monitor for respiratory complications because the danger here in your myasthenia gravis is the paralysis of your respiratory muscles. Aspiration precaution, 
that includes your swallow and gag reflexes. So we have to check those reflexes. And also we have to administer medications 30 minutes before meals to optimize muscle strength. Also, we have to encourage our patient to have a small frequent meals. Also, we need to refer them to physical and occupational therapy for further management and encourage them to have adequate rest periods. And of course, we encourage them to wear a medic alert bracelet and to educate them about the medication and the possible crisis that they would have if they would not adhere to their treatment regimen. Patient and family teaching. Also, we have to educate them about their medication regimen or management. And also, we will teach them on how to conserve their energy. And aspiration risk reduction. So, we will look into a plan of care where they can reduce their aspiration risk. And eye safety. Maintain healthy lifestyle by way of good nutrition and adequate rest and relaxation. Also, we refer them for speech therapy. Also, the patient might undergo plasma pheresis. This is to get rid of the abnormal antibodies in the body. Rehabilitation, so we have here a long-term goal, so retain independence, muscle strength, and treatment of spasticity. Now let's proceed to Guillain-Barre syndrome or GBS. It is also known as acute infectious polyneuritis and or polyradiculitis. It is acute immune-mediated polyneuropathy. And it is precipitated by events such as infection. And it causes paralysis, paresthesia, and numbness. So we have here your normal nerve. And we have here the damaged myelin sheet exposing the nerve fiber. So this is your GBS. It is somewhat the same with your multiple sclerosis. However, they differ in manifestation. So we have here the risk factors for Guillain-Barre syndrome. So possibly autoimmune, it is associated with immunizations, and it is frequently preceded by mild respiratory and intestinal infection. And it progresses over hours to days. And there is a minimal muscle atrophy. So it begins in the lower extremities and ascends bilaterally. So that means the paralysis is symmetrical. So it is manifested by weakness, ataxia, bilateral paresthesia, progressing to paralysis. And it causes problems with respiration, talking, swallowing, and bladder and bowel function. For the manifestation, we have progressive ascending weakness of the limbs leading to flaccid paralysis. So this is a bilateral manifestation. Paresthesia and numbness, postural hypotension, cardiac arrhythmias, facial flushing, abnormalities of sweating, and urinary retention. Also pain, which is common in shoulder girdle, back, and posterior thighs, with even slightest movements. For the management, we have intubation and mechanical ventilation if the patient has respiratory paralysis. Plasma pheresis is being done to get rid of the abnormal antibodies that causes the disorder. Also, we have to monitor the ECG. If hypotension occurs, we need to administer IV fluids for rehydration. Also, for the nutritional support, we give feedings entirely. Also, we advise patients to take high-caloric and high-protein diet. 
Also, we advise our patient bed rest, active or passive range of motion, or isometric exercises. We position our patient semi fallers and also we monitor the vital signs, the neurovital signs, intake and output, pulse oximetry, and vital capacity of our patient. Also, we perform indwelling catheterization if the bladder function is affected in our patient. And we perform chest physiotherapy, postural drainage, and suction if the patient develops respiratory secretions. And we refer our patient to physical therapists and occupational therapies for further management. For the possible nursing diagnosis, we have ineffective airway clearance, ineffective breathing pattern, anxiety, powerlessness, impaired mobility, risk for impaired skin integrity, imbalanced nutrition, less than body requirements, and impaired verbal communication. For the nursing intervention, we have maintaining respiratory function. So we have to assess for gag reflex, assess for difficulty in coughing and swallowing, and encourage use of incentive spirometry, provide chest physiotherapy, and elevate the head of the bed to facilitate respiratory and promote effective coughing. Next is monitoring for complications, such as respiratory failure and cardiovascular problems. By way of assessing for respiratory function and needs for ventilation, such as decreased oxygen saturation and increased pulse rate, shallow and irregular breathing. And also monitor for report cardiac dysrhythmias, transient hypertension, deep vein thrombosis, and pulmonary embolism. Next is enhancing mobility and preventing complications of immobility by way of providing passive range of motion and support paralyzed extremity in functional position and of course, we change position every two hours and ensure adequate hydration and nutrition to prevent malnutrition and dehydration. And lastly, we use anti-embolism stockings to prevent the development of your deep vein thrombosis. Now let's proceed to cranial nerve disorders. We have trigeminal neuralgia and Bell's palsy. First, let's discuss trigeminal neuralgia, also known as tic durolo. It is a painful disorder of one or more branches of the trigeminal nerve. There is a paroxysmal attacks of excruciating facial pain precipitated by stimulation of a trigger zone. And it is manifested by facial tics or grimaces. There is stabbing paroxysmal attacks of pain that usually are limited to the unilateral sensory distribution of one or more branches of the trigeminal nerve. For the signs and symptoms, there is a sudden or severe episodes of intense facial pain lasting less than 30 to 60 seconds and ending abruptly. Following stimulation of a trigger zone, usually by a light touch or a hypersensitive area, such as the tip of the nose, the cheeks, or the gums. And the pain is always unilateral. For the nursing management, it is directed on relieving the pain and maintaining adequate nutrition. Now let's proceed to Bell's palsy. It is a sudden weakness or paralysis of the muscles of the face due to malfunction of cranial nerve number 7, which is the facial nerve, which stimulates facial muscles. The seventh cranial nerve exits the skull at the stylomastoid foramen, passes through the parotid gland, 
and subdivides into five branches that supply the facial muscles. Paralysis of the nerve may occur without any known cause. Bell's palsy is thought to be caused by swelling of the nerve within the facial or fallopian canal. For the clinical manifestations of Bell's palsy, we have Bell's phenomenon. Incomplete eye closure on weak side shows eye movement that is normally covered by eyelid. Eye rolls upward when attempt made to close it with excessive tearing. There is also soggy mouth, dribbling of saliva, and drinks. And the patient has difficulty in speaking. They experience ringing in the ears or tinnitus. There is also alteration or loss of taste at the front of the tongue. Also, there is dryness or watering of the affected eye and pain around the jaw or ear. And of course, there is a unilateral facial weakness. So the possible symptoms of Bell's palsy are droopy eyelid, dry eye or excessive tears, facial paralysis, twitching or weakness, and drooping corner of the mouth, dry mouth, and impaired taste. So this is how your Bell's palsy looks like. Also this one. For the nursing assessment, we have to test motor components of facial nerves and observe patient's ability to handle secretions, food, and fluids. Also, we have to assess patient's ability to blink and speak clearly and assess effects of altered appearance on body image. For the possible nursing diagnosis, we have acute pain because of the facial pain experienced by the patient and body image disturbances because of some deformities on the facial feature of the patient. For the nursing management, we have first is to avoid hot foods and fluids, arrange for privacy at mealtimes to avoid embarrassment, apply facial sling to improve lip alignment, and provide frequent mouth care. Provide massage therapy to relax the muscles, especially the facial muscles of the patient, and encourage active facial exercises. Protect eye with patch as indicated to prevent dryness. And apply moist heat to affected side of the face to reduce the pain. Now let's proceed to oncologic and degenerative disorders. First, we have your brain tumor. We also have your Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, and muscular dystrophies. First, let's discuss brain tumors. A brain tumor is a localized intracranial lesion which occupies space with the skull and tends to cause a rise in intracranial pressure. That means this causes an increase in intracranial pressure because of the added volume in the brain. For the signs and symptoms, we have progressive course of symptoms over a period of time. And symptoms are dependent primarily on the location of the mass within the brain. And the symptoms are related to increased intracranial pressure. So here is a cut section of the brain. So you would see here that there is a brain tumor. So this is a CT scan image with a brain tumor. For the treatment, so first we have surgery. It is the initial management of virtually all brain tumors. It establishes the diagnosis and achieves tumor removal in many cases. Next is irradiation. It can increase longevity and sometimes can allay symptoms when tumor recur. So it's by the use of radiation to decrease the growth of the tumor. Also, we have chemotherapy. Its use is somewhat limited by the blood-brain barrier. It is given intravenously 
intraarterially, intrathecally, or intraventricularly. We have here your preoperative medical and nursing management. First, we have to instruct the patient and family about the necessity and importance of diagnostic tests. We have to monitor and record vital signs and neurological status accurately every two to four hours or as ordered. Also, we have to institute measures to prevent inadvertent increase in intracranial pressure. Institute seizures precaution at patient's bedside. And maintain airway patency. We also have to give supportive nursing care depending upon the patient's symptoms and ability to perform activities of daily living. And administer all doses of steroids and anti-epileptic agents on time. This is to prevent recurrence of seizure episodes. And surgery or craniotomy is performed to remove neoplasm and alleviate the symptoms. For the post-operative nursing care considerations, we have meticulous nursing management and care aimed at prevention of post-operative complications are imperative for the patient's survival. Accurately monitor and record all vital signs and neurologic signs. And administer artificial tears, eye drops as ordered, to prevent corneal ulceration in the comatose patient. And we have to maintain skin integrity. Also, we have to maintain head of bed at 30 degrees elevation. This is to decrease intracranial pressure and to promote venous return. Perform passive range of motion exercises to all extremities every two to four hours and institute seizure precautions at patient's bedside. Maintain accurate record of intake and output of the patient. And prevent pulmonary complications associated with bed rest. So we have to position our patient every two hours and we perform chest physiotherapy to drain any possible respiratory secretions and continuously talk to the patient while providing care and reorienting him to person, place, and time. Now let's proceed to Parkinson's disease. It is known as shaking palsy. It is a chronic progressive degenerative disorder affecting the brain centers that are responsible for control and regulation of movements. So basically, the problem here in your Parkinson's disease is on the control and regulation of movements. And it usually affects people over age 50. Affects men more than women. So we have a part in the brain which is called your substantia nigra. It is a collection of midbrain nuclei that project fiber to the corpus striatum. So we have here an image wherein the substantia nigra is diminished as seen in Parkinson's disease. So a very important neurotransmitters responsible for the movements and the development of Parkinson's disease is dopamine, which is one of the major neurotransmitters in the substantia nigra and in other parts of the central nervous system. And it is important in inhibiting function in the central control of movement. So basically, this dopamine is responsible for the regulation and control of the movements. So as you noticed here, in Parkinson's disease, we have a diminished or insufficient dopamine level. Thus, creating a problem in terms of the control and movement processes. For the clinical manifestations, we have rigidity, akinesia, or bradykinesia, and tremors. 
So these three signs and symptoms are the cardinal signs of Parkinson's disease. So it refers to the problems in control and regulation of movement. For the clinical manifestations, we have first tremor. So we have tremors of the hands, arms, legs, jaw, and face. So that's, that could be in the lips or tongue. It is a rhythmic alternating flexion and contraction movements, 4 to 6 beats per minute, that resemble the motion of a rolling appeal between the thumb and forefinger. So the characteristics of tremors are it is slow turning motion of the forearm and the hand pronation and supination and a motion of the thumb against the fingers or pin rolling. Next is rigidity. Resistance to movement of both flexors and extensors throughout the full ROM. We also have akinesia or bradykinesia. Slowness in initiating and performing movements and difficulty in sudden unexpected stopping of voluntary movements. So here are the additional clinical manifestations of Parkinson's disease. There is loss of blinking reflex, drooling, dysarthria, dysphagia, slow, high-pitched, monotonous speech, excessive and uncontrolled sweating, loss of position sense with postural instability, stooped posture, mask-like facial expression, oculogyric crisis or the upward ruling of your eyes, dementia, which is a very important feature associated with Parkinson's disease. So this is a feature of your Parkinson's disease. So there is a rigidity and trembling of head, rigidity and trembling of extremities, forward tilt of trunk, reduced arm swinging, and shuffling gait with short steps. For the nursing diagnosis, we have impaired physical mobility related to muscle rigidity and weakness. So we provide a safe environment, instruct to perform stretching exercises and postural ex exercises daily and as tolerated. Teach patient correct walking techniques such as walking erect, using a wide base gait, raising the feet while walking and swinging the arms, and encourage to take warm baths and receive massage to help relax the muscles. Also, we have self-care deficits related to tremor and motor disturbance. So we have to teach and support patient during the performance of activities of daily living. Next is constipation related to medication and reduced activity. So we encourage to follow a regular time pattern of defecation and instruct to increase fluid intake and instruct to eat foods with moderate fiber content. This is to prevent and relieve constipation. Next, we have altered nutrition, less than body requirements related to tremor, slowness in eating, difficulty in chewing and swallowing. So we assist the patient to sit upright during mealtime. Teach patient or family to cut food into small bite-sized pieces to prevent choking. A semi-solid diet with thick liquids is easier to swallow than solid and thin liquids. Encourage to chew first on one side of the mouth and then the other. Next is impaired verbal communication related to decreased speech volume slowness of speech and inability to move facial nerves. So we collaborate with a speech language therapist. Remind the patient to face the listener, clearly pronounce the words, speak in short sentences, and take a few deep breaths before speaking. And we have ineffective coping 
related to depression and dysfunction due to disease progression. So we have to provide emotional support and encouragement to our patient, encourage compliance to regimen, and instruct to take frequent rest periods to overcome fatigue. Now let's proceed to Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease, also known as Huntington's chorea, hereditary chorea, chronic progressive chorea, and adult chorea. It is a progressive and degenerative disease. It is associated with dementia and chorea. Chorea is a jerking movement. So basically, your Huntington's disease is related to movement problems. The cause is unknown and there is no cure. It is related to family, origin, and hereditary. So the pathophysiology of your Huntington's disease is there is a cellular destruction and atrophy of other areas and there is a neurotransmitter imbalance between your GABA and your dopamine. If there is an imbalance between these neurotransmitters, there will be a problem in the motor function. So for the manifestation we have, for motor effects, we have memory loss, lack of initiative, loss of spontaneity, inability to concentrate, restlessness, coriform, dystonic posture, and also there is a psychosocial manifestations here. For the interdisciplinary care, so we diagnose Huntington's disease through genetic testing, PET or CT scan or DNA analysis. So here are the possible medications for Huntington's disease. So we administer antipsychotics, psychotherapy, antidepressants, amantidine, and haloperidol. So basically these are the medications that we give to our patients with Huntington's disease. Our nursing care is directed to physiologic, psychosocial, and ethical challenges. So for the nursing diagnosis and interventions, we have risk for aspiration, impaired verbal communication, impaired skin integrity, imbalanced nutrition, less than body requirements. So based on this nursing diagnosis, we can now perform our nursing interventions by focusing on these problems. Next, let's proceed to muscular dystrophies. Muscular dystrophies are a group of incurable muscle disorders characterized by progressive weakening and wasting of the skeletal or voluntary muscles. So the most common muscular dystrophy is Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So we have here a goer sign. So there is a difficulty in standing up because of muscular dystrophies. Also, we have here a features of persons who have a muscular dystrophy. So as you can see, there is a deviation or deformities in the body. For the common characteristics, we have there is a varying degrees of muscle wasting and weakness and abnormal elevation in serum levels of muscle enzymes. The goals of care for patients with muscular dystrophies are maintain function at optimal levels and enhance the quality of life. For the therapy, we have performing range of motion and stretching exercises. And also, we encourage our patient to do exercises. And application of braces and mobility aids. And breathing assistance. I believe this is the end of our lecture on the care of patients with neurologic disorders. Thank you so much for listening.